What if I told you that there was a game for the DS released back in 2008, which was so obscure that until relatively recently, there was hardly even a trace of it on the entire internet? And even still today, you'd be hard pressed to find much gameplay footage of it at all. Maybe you wouldn't even be all that surprised. The DS is packed to the brim with shovelware, garbage that most people would have likely have forgotten about or never really cared about in the first place. But that's just the thing that's so anomalous about this game. It wasn't shovelware. In fact, not only was this game very ahead of its time really in my opinion, but as far as I'm concerned, it was a masterpiece. Doodle Hex. Ever heard of... Ugh, who am I kidding? Literally not a single one of you have heard of this game, that's exactly why I'm making this video. Before I get into what the actual game is, I really want to hammer this in for you. I am not just saying that this game is good considering the low expectations you would have for a forgotten DS game not a soul seems to remember the existence of. Like it's just an above average game and I'm making a big deal of it because you'd expect it to be trash. No, when I say this game was a masterpiece in my eyes, I mean it. To really just put this in perspective, as a young kid, the DS was the first uh, console I grew up on. All the first video games I played in my life were a mix of Flash games and DS games. So I have a special connection with the DS library of games as a whole, and have poured hundreds of hours of playtime into even just the okay games I had on it. When it came to the games that I genuinely loved on it, I was probably pushing towards thousands of hours in total. I had a lot of games on the DS too, so there were many I could have picked from to be my absolute favourite. Many of them I am deeply nostalgic for, and many of them I still love to this day, but many of them I still wouldn't call masterpieces. Bomberman Land Touch was one of my favourites as a kid, and revisiting it, I still enjoy it and consider it a pretty good game but in hindsight can absolutely acknowledge a couple glaring issues where the game feels a little cheap, clunky or shallow. So I can see why it's kind of been forgotten a bit despite being tied to a, such a well-known name. Doodle Hex, on the other hand, is a game I've played for hours on end for literal years of my life and I've never once gotten bored of playing it, even despite the slightly lacking amount of content within it. Every time I revisit it, I will happily recomplete the whole thing all over again. And of course, like any underrated game, it has a pretty damn good soundtrack. Maybe not one of the absolute best out there, there are a couple that I find pretty meh, but most of the themes in the game are really quite good. And sorry for all the preamble, but one last thing. I am not able to record this on an actual DS, so I'm having to play it on emulator. That means a few things. For one, it might look a little bit blurry, I can't really do much about that I'm afraid because, well, this game is designed for the tiny screen of a DS and I'm blowing it up to my 2560x1440 monitor. The second is, of course, being a DS game, this game uses two screens, however thankfully the top screen isn't very important in this game. It mostly just shows these animations that correlate to the different attacks the characters do but most of the time you can just see what rune they cast instead of having to look at the attack animation. And even for the runes you can't see on the track, they all have their own distinct sound effects to signify when they've been cast. <laughs> the only important information up here is the time limit on the match, which you rarely reach. And in this game, every game is a best of three, so there's win counters here. Lastly, I'd just like to preemptively warn you that since this game is relatively fast paced and requires precise and quick drawing, only I'm using a mouse instead of a stylus like usual, I'm a little bit rusty on emulator. Particularly this footage here is the first bit of footage I recorded and you can really tell I'm struggling to draw with a mouse. I do a lot better later on, but in this footage I'm struggling. <laughs> to start, you might have been a bit confused watching the gameplay in the background. How does this game actually work? This is one of the first thing that makes me find it baffling that this game was forgotten, because as far as I'm aware, even though the rules of the game are relatively simple, I do not know of a single other game in the world that plays similarly to Doodle Hex. So uh, that's you on the bottom, and there's your opponent on the top. You can see the centre of the screen is filled with most of the information you're going to need while playing the game, and it's honestly laid out in a way I find really impressive. 
everything you need to know being so central really helps you focus in such a fast-paced game. Right in the center is the drawing board. To cast spells, you look at the spells you have available to your character, displayed in the collection of 12 slots surrounding the drawing board, referred to as the Grimoire, and you draw the matching symbol on the drawing board. Spells cost mana to cast, but mana constantly passively regenerates. Your mana is cleverly displayed inside the drawing board by the shaded area of the circle, and if you don't have enough mana to cast a spell, you won't be able to cast it, and that will be indicated by the symbol for that spell being blacked out on the grimoire. When you cast a spell, it always comes out to the right side of your character. When you draw a spell, it doesn't have to be a perfect match. Of course, the game's going to try and recognize whatever you drew, and for the most part, it's pretty good at that job. There are definitely exceptions. There are a few runes that are needlessly picky, where you can make a very small mistake and it won't even know what you're trying to draw. Of course, that's expected to be an issue. Any game like this is going to run into that problem. However, it's genuinely only a couple of them that have that problem. I would say that probably at least three quarters of the spells in this game are actually very good in terms of the game recognizing when you draw them, even if your drawing's a little bit iffy. If you draw the rune accurately enough, the game even rewards you by making that rune perfect, meaning it's completely unblockable. When you cast a spell, it always comes out to the right side of your character and will traverse around the circle anti-clockwise towards your opponent. It will obviously hit them once it reaches them. Of course though, there's a catch. Your opponent can put up their shield to block the spells you cast at them as long as they aren't perfect, completely negating their damage or effects. Of course though, you can also do this back. To shield, you simply press and hold on your character. But, of course, while shielding, you'll not only find yourself unable to draw any runes, but you also stop regenerating mana until you release your shield. You also have to be wary of the fact that your shield is not instant. It must charge up over time, and it will only block a rune if it's charged enough to have become larger than the rune you're trying to block. Okay, that's cool, but how do I get past this shield? Well, you have a couple of options. The simplest one would be to, well, just cast a red rune. So far, you've been casting green runes, which can come in different sizes, but size aside, all green runes do the same thing. They damage the opponent, but only if they aren't blocked. Red runes are slower and more expensive than green runes, and also come in different sizes like green runes, but they still manage to deal half the damage they would have done, even if they are blocked. They also do a little bit more damage than green runes would typically. Now, if these all seem a little simple so far, that's because, as you'd expect, the green and red runes are the bread and butter of Doodle Hex. But with the other two types, things get a lot spicier. Blue runes are curses, which can also be blocked, but if not blocked, will have some kind of a negative effect on the opponent. What that negative effect could be varies wildly. Every character starts with the same four runes. A small and medium green rune, a small red rune, and a curse which temporarily completely disables the opponent's shield if it lands. So there's an example of a pretty simple curse that every character in the game has access to. There's a lot more crazier ones though, like ones that force you to forget how to cast runes, curses that flip your screen upside down or shake it, and curses that pause all your runes in place and disable your drawing board. Now that's cool and all, but how do we ever land these curses if they can just block them? Well, this is where things get skillful. That's poggers. While curses bounce harmlessly off of these shields, green runes will damage the shield if blocked and cause it to shrink. Using clusters of overlapping green runes, you can break your opponent's shield and hit them with more green runes from behind, or curses while they're defenseless and their shield isn't able to regenerate fast enough. Only problem is, all of these runes seem to travel at different speeds. You have to use these markings left around the circle as guides of when to time the casting of your different runes with different travel speeds, so that by the time they reach the opponent, the runes all overlap perfectly with the green runes hitting them first and the curses hitting them last. Finally, we have the yellow runes, or blessings. And if I were to call a single rune type the strongest in the game, I would definitely say it's blessings. No one starts with a blessing, but everyone learns at least one eventually. Blessings apply a temporary benefit to yourself instantly upon being casted, without having to travel along the track. These benefits can range wildly from increased mana regen, to becoming a giant, to transforming green runes into red runes, to speed boosts, to lifesteal, to curse removal, to auto shielding, and even full wipes of every rune on the screen. A character's blessings are usually the most defining runes in their kit when it comes to shaping their playstyle. Uh, speaking of, the characters.
Now, as much as I love this game, I'm not going to ignore the few shortcomings it does have. One of them being, while just about every character is pretty fun to play with only a couple exceptions, I'd definitely say the designs and personalities of them are hit or miss. <laughs> Obviously though, it's the gameplay that matters more, and in that regard the only complaint I have is that some of them play very similarly to others, but I would only say one or maybe two of them play outright badly, so it's a fair trade. When you make a fresh profile, you have 10 characters to pick from. The story for all 10 characters is that you're participating in a tournament at this school of magic with the friendly ghost mage Kalamazoo's training in an effort to obtain the one wish rune, a rune that will grant you one single wish. That wish obviously depends on which character you pick. So let's go in order, shall we? <clears throat> Faye is late epic goth GF, but watch out. She's not like other girls. She's British. We are off to a good start. Her story is literally just she wants to be left alone or forever. <laughs> in all seriousness though, Faye was a good pick for the first one in the menu. I would consider her one of the most powerful characters in the game, absolutely, as well as being relatively straightforward to play. This game is fast paced and demands your attention in multiple areas simultaneously at times, which can really get your brain to lock up and fall apart in the panic, especially when you're a newer player. But Faye is probably the single most effective character in the game at just stalling for time and stabilizing from bad situations to give you a moment to regain your composure. She does this mostly using two runes, one which is definitely the lesser of the two evils, a curse which manages to completely pause all runes on the screen and the opponent's ability to draw runes, which only she can learn as well. But she also has one other rune completely exclusive to her, Petalfall. It's a blessing which, while expensive, completely deletes an entire rune of any type or size, even perfect runes, as long as it is the closest enemy rune to hitting you. Now yes, you can still be overwhelmed when you can only remove one rune at a time and you're attacked with multiple, but even just removing one rune can often completely dismantle entire combo setups, especially because it's very common that someone will cast a curse that will be the slowest of the runes they're casting at you, and then later cast faster green runes to catch up with that curse and break your shield. But of course, since the curse is always going to be at the front until it hits you, because it was cast first, that means it's really easy to just delete the curse. And they'll still send the green runes at you, but the thing you were scared of was the curse. Now you can just block the green runes and maybe you'll take a little bit of damage, but you'll be fine. And of course, that isn't even to mention how powerful this is when it comes to dealing with perfect runes or enormous red runes. There's Strat, who is an elf with pixie wings, and while the rest of his kind sing sappy songs about love and all that, he just wants to be a rock star. He is very quick and able to use his blessings to send tightly packed runes flying at the opponent at lightning fast speeds. Though that being said, if he's ever forced to play defensive, he is screwed. He only owns one single rune capable of helping him survive a large attack, and it is a curse that puts his opponents in slow motion. Which, don't get me wrong, is a very strong curse, but having a curse as your only defensive option is very unreliable, because of course, it's hard to land the curse in the first place, and even when you do land it, it's not like it activates the second you cast it, you have to wait for it to reach your opponent. So it's very hard to time it, so that by the time their runes are put in slow motion, that is, when you needed to have the slow motion to be able to block them all. Either way, Strat is very fun though. I'm not sure if he'd really be one of the strongest in the game, but he's definitely the most able to rush opponents down in seconds. He's definitely the most glass cannon character in the game. Cassie is one of the only characters who I actually feel has a relatively strong story behind them, even if it's of course short, just like everyone else's. She's a witch from a poor family who just wants to be recognized with the same respect as the other doodlers, the names that they have for these wizards. But since her family couldn't afford to send her to the College of Runes, she's unfortunately just a janitor there who sneaks into the occasional lesson to learn what she can. Cassie's also especially close with Kalamazoo compared to the other characters. Although Kalamazoo will be your friend who tutors you throughout the game no matter which character you pick, but Kalamazoo is especially close with Cassie as he would take the time out to try and teach her himself, being a skilled doodler back when he was alive. And I also thought that as short as it was, the ending of Cassie's story was especially sweet. But I'm not telling. Go play the game yourself and earn that ending. No, seriously, no joke. I'm not telling you because it's not going to feel very satisfying if I just tell you. It'll feel a lot better if you, you know, put in the work to find it. 
I'm serious. Play the game. Anyway, that being said, it might be a bit difficult for you to beat the game with Cassie. You see, this game is actually genuinely pretty damn hard by the end of it, and Cassie is probably the hardest character in the roster to beat the game with. Cassie is all in on disruptive curses that prevent your opponent from doing what they want to do. She does this in a lot of ways, but the most iconic is her ability to transform the opponent into a pig who has a much weaker shield and can only cast small red runes. The problem with that is that as you continue to face smarter and smarter opponents with access to more and more powerful runes and tools, you'll start to find it really, really hard to reliably land your curses. And if you can't land any, you won't have much to defend yourself with. Worse still, Cassie is very lacking in aggressive capabilities too. The best she gets in that regard is really a blessing which halves the mana cost of her next three runes cast. Which don't get me wrong, is actually quite a strong blessing, it's just alone it is nowhere near enough to carry her kit. Cassie is definitely a contender for worst character in the game, but I don't dislike playing her. She feels like one of the highest skill ceiling characters as well, so even if it may not be super worthwhile putting in all that effort into getting better at playing her, my god, is it satisfying to pop off with her when you do, because you know you earned it. Cassie does not get OP abilities to cheese her way through fights or turn your brain off. She has to work for every single hit she gets. Points for being unintentionally poetic, I guess. The poor, hard-working girl who wants to prove herself that no one appreciates is also the underpowered but difficult to play and respectable character. <laughs> By the end of the game, she does learn the same speed up blessing that Strat has that allows him to be very aggressive. However, her version is a longer version, which is actually a problem. You see, a lot of characters will often learn the same runes as other characters, only their runes might be a shorter or longer version. It will still have the same effect, but it might cost a bit more mana, take a bit longer to draw, or the effect might last longer. The problem here is, is that the speed up blessing is very timing dependent and Strat's version of the rune is something that you can actually cast in one quick hand motion, if you get the right shape at least. This one extra line on Cassie's version though, is unfortunately just enough to make it so that you can't just quickly cast this whenever you want to. You have to take a little bit longer to draw it, and although that sounds insignificant, when speed blessings are so timing dependent, it really makes things a lot tougher. Not to mention that the only benefit you get for that is that the speed up blessing lasts longer, but already the shortest version lasts just about as long as you're ever going to need it to last. So the extra duration, if anything, makes things worse, because you might just catch the tail end of your speed boost when you're setting up your next combo, and the speed boost that quickly runs out might put your runes out of position and break your own combos. Anyway, there's the Jin, who is a genie from the Bronx, who's been forced to fulfill the wishes of gangsters, and he's here to earn his freedom from them. A very straightforward and reliable character to play, he hits hard and specializes in red runes, being one of the only starting 10 characters to learn how to cast the giant red rune by the end of the game, capable of eviscerating a third of the enemy's health bar if left unblocked. He can also transform green runes into red ones and enlarge his runes. Princess Tiffany is the worst character in the game, hands down, and the only one that I outright dislike. When I say that, I don't mean that she's bad bad, although she is also bad. I find it hard to pick who's weaker out of her and Cassie, but Cassie at least has a good story behind her and is actually kind of fun to play. Princess Tiffany is intentionally made to be an annoying and shallow spoiled rich girl, and I guess they succeeded in doing that, so congrats? She can turn people into a frog, which works the exact same way as Cassie's, only it leaves them only able to cast small green runes instead of red, but other than that, she seriously lacks identity. She has one other character exclusive curse which doubles the cost of the opponent's next two runes, but the obvious response to that is just to cast two small green runes, and then this curse just becomes interrupt what your opponent was going to do for like two seconds max. And yes, I'm afraid the AI opponents in this game are smart enough to do that and not let you get high value off of this curse. She does also have a blessing called Gold Digger that increases her mana gain, which you're going to be using a hell of a lot of since she's so lacking in any other good runes to cast. But that rune's also shared by Nadia and Rainbow. The only reason why Princess Tiffany uses it way more than those two is because while for Nadia, and especially Rainbow, this blessing is just like another tool to complement the rest of their kit. Princess Tiffany, that rune is her kit. It's the only thing that really glues together this incoherent mess. Okay, maybe that's a little harsh, but you can see that this is definitely the character I dislike the most. 
When I was a lot younger first playing this game, for the most part, I avoided a lot of the quote-unquote girly characters. And later when I came back to it, I was excited to try them out and see what they had to offer. And most of them I was pleasantly surprised with, but Princess Tiffany, honestly, I might have been better off never playing them. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on though, there's Sandy, who is of course all about voodoo, and is looking to save his brother, who he accidentally transformed into a voodoo doll, nice going. Oh! He obviously uses a lot of curses, but he also hits pretty hard with his enlargement blessing and life stealing curses. Speaking of which, Sandy is one of the few Doodle Hex characters capable of healing, which makes his life steal curse surprisingly powerful. He also has a curse which allows him to slowly drain health from the opponent over time, which even works super well in combination with the lifesteal curse. Strangely enough, healing is really rare in Doodle Hex. Only Sandy, Nadia, and one of the bosses, Miss Madrugada, can do it. And in all cases, it's lifesteal. Rainbow is... oh wait. Uh, oh god, uh, listen, uh... I don't think the devs back in 2008 realized the connotations this would have with the... Things we wish didn't exist that we have to deal with in this day and age. So, uh, keep your minds out of the gutter for this one, please. Okay? Okay. So, Rainbow is the 4,500 year old daughter of Thor, but of course, in God years, that's like being four years old. She's basically sick of being treated like a little kid, so she sneaks off to the College of Runes to prove herself. Okay. Now we've addressed the elephant in the room we can get back to the actual substance here. That being, my god, this character is broken and I love it. They just gave her everything. You want automatic shielding while still gaining mana? Got it. Want to become a giant with a shield triple the size of normal that also regenerates faster while using your auto shielding? Sure thing. You want increased mana gain? But of course. You want the ability to make your runes perfect and unblockable on demand? Knock yourself out. Hell, take the biggest green rune in the game while you're at it. At this point, don't even bother bringing it up she has a speed boost blessing. It's not like it matters when she already has everything else she's ever going to need. If any of you watching go and play this game after watching this, I recommend this is the first character you should hop on. She is a blast to play and just lets you have an absolute power trip. But even then, I wouldn't say playing her is brainless too. While when all of your blessings are active, you are an unstoppable monster, there is a good amount of challenge to juggling them all while still defending incoming runes and constructing your own combos. Out of the 10 characters we have to pick from here, I think Rainbow or Fae are the two characters in the running for the strongest character to start with. Honestly, half the challenge of playing Rainbow is being able to draw all these runes fast enough that you can have all these blessings up simultaneously and can continue to be an absolute monster steamrolling anyone in your path. But that just makes her an even better starter character, considering, of course, when you start this game, you're going to be a lot less uh, experienced with being able to draw these runes quickly and accurately. So it only makes sense to start with a character that lets you be stupidly overpowered as long as you can draw quickly and accurately to teach you how to draw quickly and accurately. <laughs> Caleb is made to be the all-rounder of the group, and so naturally, he's pretty bland overall. His story is also pretty bland. Essentially, his father was murdered by a... Uh, certain doodler that we're going to get to later, and he's looking for vengeance. I suppose I'd say he specializes with green runes, because he does learn the largest green rune in the game, and learns a decent amount of blessings that just happen to synergize pretty well with green runes. But they did also give him something to spice him up a bit. Caleb does learn one rune no other character has any variation of, and that is a blessing, which is very expensive, and even hurts yourself to use. But, for that price, you get to instantly wipe all runes of any size or any type instantly off the screen. Definitely one of the more crazy abilities in the game, although genuinely one I would consider a little underwhelming on average. Definitely though, when this blessing does see its use, it is a lifesaver that can swing games. Gizmo is a weird one. You can probably guess just by looking at him the story here. Kid Genius wants to prove himself by testing his battle robot out in this tournament. I always thought of him as the defensive specialist before when I was younger, even though Faye's defense stat is higher on the character select. Because Faye didn't have an auto shield blessing like Gizmo does. But I'm starting to question that now. While early in the game, Gizmo's combination of auto shielding and his damage absorbing barrier, which can also absorb otherwise unblockable attacks, does well, later in the game, Faye's more expensive and awkward to draw, but much stronger barrier 
combined with Petal Fall means she fares much better than Gizmo later in the game, when a lot of characters have many ways to hit you with attacks that are simply unblockable by normal means. When Gizmo's faced with a situation like that, all he can do is put up his weak barrier and put up his auto shield, but that doesn't make his shield stronger, it just makes it automatic. It doesn't actually make the shield able to block more. Meanwhile, Faye can just delete half the attack and absorb the rest of it with her barrier. Early on, this isn't necessary because attacks aren't that enormous, and so you're kind of spending more mana than you need to, which is why early on I thought Gizmo was the better character at defense. But Gizmo certainly finds himself struggling a lot by the end of the game. And one thing I often forget, because it doesn't seem like a very Gizmo-y thing to have, is that he does have a blessing that no one else has any variation of as well. This very weirdly shaped J sort of blessing, which is a blessing which massively speeds up the recharge speed of your pet, which we're gonna get back to more thoroughly later, but in short, your pet will allow you to either cast one perfect rune whenever you want without having to draw it perfectly, or will allow you to temporarily shield anything, including red runes and perfect runes, just for a couple seconds. So you can recharge those abilities back faster using this blessing. Anyway, finally there's Nadia, who is not a bad character, but a good example of one of my main issues with the characters. She's a fortune teller who's sick of having to lie to people with awful futures ahead of them, telling them that they're destined for greatness to get money out of them. The problem is that she's another character who feels a little lacking in identity. She has a life-stealing curse, but she kind of took that from Sandy. She has a mana gain blessing, which definitely makes sense in her kit at first, as it allows you to make the thicker clusters of green runes needed to help break shields and land those curses. But then they just kind of give her the perfect rune blessing, which makes the mana gain a little obsolete, since now you can kind of just make your curses perfect instead. You're more limited by how quickly you can draw than by how quickly you can spend your mana at that point. By the time they give her the enlargement blessing, it feels like this character is just a weird mix of Sandy, Princess Tiffany, and Rainbow all at the same time, with only one completely unique rune. Although that one unique rune is pretty cool. A curse that makes your opponent forget four of their runes at random, making them completely uncastable temporarily. And hilariously enough, that does stack. Although that curse also kind of sucks, at least by the late game. Early on it's not too bad, because I think it's actually one of the biggest curses in the game. You only have to do a very small amount of shield damage to be able to get this curse through, so it's easier to land. But then you have to hope that the four runes it hits are actually, you know, significant. The main mode of the game, tournament mode, but I'm gonna keep calling it story mode anyway, has you compete against AI opponents playing the other nine characters that you didn't pick, learning more runes from each game you win. As you'd expect, as you progress, each enemy learns more and more runes, as well as becoming more intelligent with each game. And I actually do genuinely mean that. The first couple of fights, the AI is, uh, well, probably how you'd expect. But by the end of the game, they're pretty smart, honestly. Don't get me wrong, it's certainly hit or miss. Certain characters in particular can be very stupid at times. The AI for Caleb is pretty awful. It's pretty common for me to have games with Caleb where I simply just non-stop cast runes and never shield because they keep casting the blessing that wipes the entire screen, which sounds annoying. However, it's actually a free win because every time they cast it, they deal damage to themselves. The AI is at least smart enough to recognize to not cast it when the damage would kill them. But I have had many games against Caleb AIs where they just keep casting that rune until they have one health and I literally never have to shield all game because none of their runes ever reach me because they keep destroying their own runes. <laughs> it's um, questionable behavior. But honestly, besides Caleb in that one situation, I can't really think of any other character AIs which are particularly stupid. They generally tend to be quite intelligent. I mean, I already mentioned before, they seem to have special use cases programmed when they get hit with certain curses already for how to react to that, because I already mentioned that when you hit them with that Princess Tiffany curse, which doubles the cost of their next two runes, they seem to tend to know that they can just cast the cheapest rune in the game twice to quickly get rid of that curse's effects. Probably the stupidest thing about the AI that is a consistent problem is the fact that you can tell for the most part they just are pre-programmed to keep attacking you with the same sort of rune formations in a kind of semi-random cycle. But honestly, I don't have a problem with that, especially because once you've played the game a lot, you'll know all these formations that they try casting at you, 
And so you can kind of use that knowledge against them. Which, yeah, certainly you probably won't work like that in a fight against a real person. But I think it really helps when you get to some of the especially difficult ending fights in the story that feel near impossible. It's a lot more encouraging knowing, okay, the odds may seem basically impossible for me to ever win this but I know that they're always going to fall into a finite pool of different ways they're going to attack me. So I can obviously plan around, okay, what set of runes could I use that are like particularly effective against these kind of attacks they're going to throw at me? Anyway, there are three major sections of the game. The bronze... Silver... and gold towers. Each containing three battles and one quote-unquote boss fight. These bosses are the three teachers of the College of Runes, more powerful than any of the other characters and having access to extra powerful runes only they can learn to use. They are the guardians of the three pieces of the One Wish Rune and they will be your final battle for each tower to prove yourself worthy of guarding the peace that they hold. Each character will always fight the same nine enemies and same three teachers, but the order is different for every character. So one character you may have breezed past when they only had a couple runes in the bronze tower may actually be your greatest obstacle as another character if you confront them later in the gold tower when they have all of their runes available and their AI is actually playing smart. I actually really like this mechanic. Obviously it is just another way to kind of extend the playtime, but I have to admit it's surprisingly effective. Funnily enough, there are actually a couple examples of certain characters where I memorize, okay, they're not a problem if I get them in Gold Tower or Bronze Tower, but if I get them in Silver Tower, they're gonna be a big problem. Stuff like that. Like seeing Princess Tiffany in the Silver Tower is actually quite intimidating, even though she's usually pretty easy to take down in the Bronze Tower or the Gold Tower because, and unfortunately I've got to mention it again before I really get in depth about it, but the pet that allows you to use the super shield to block anything you want, that's something you only unlock after completing the silver tower. So the silver tower is the latest part in the game where you can be playing and still not be able to use the super shield. Now usually if Princess Tiffany tries to turn you into a frog, you can just use the super shield to block the green runes and the curse easily. But if you're in the silver tower, Princess Tiffany is not only going to have access to a lot more runes to be able to get through your shield, but you're also not going to have access to the only way you can prevent yourself from being turned into a frog consistently, unless you have some kind of rune specially on your character that helps deal with that situation. It's a small detail, but I genuinely think it adds a lot of extra kind of depth and playtime to the game, so it doesn't feel like it's exactly the same every time you play someone's story mode. Anyway, let's get back to these three teachers. Just like the normal characters that you face, the order that you fight them in is also random. So once again, you might find certain teachers really easy to deal with at certain points, but much harder at later points. First, there's Professor Carbuncle. Carbuncle. Or Carbuncle? I think it's Carbuncle. I think he just wants to pronounce it weird. Anyway, he's a master of curses with the ability to create portals that send runes back to their enemies, and he can also transform smaller red and green runes into their larger counterparts. His defense is absolutely maxed out, but he still maintains respectable speed and damage. Madrugada. <laughs> Ms. Madrugada, or Ms. Madrugada, honestly, I don't know anymore. It sounds much more like Madrugada, and everyone I see calls her Madrugada. But this character select says Madrugada, and I don't know what to think anymore. Anyway, she's a vampire who puts out enormous unblockable damage with her mastery of red runes while also retaining respectable defense and speed. She can blind her opponent, steal health as she damages to heal herself, and enlarges her runes. She can even reduce the cost of her runes to be able to afford them constantly which is especially scary since she has access to the largest red rune in the game, which because of how powerful it is, should cost all of your mana. So being able to halve the cost of that on demand is an enormously powerful ability to have.
Lepang. Finally, there's Lepang, who is a martial arts expert who moves fast and can gain mana either by blocking or by stealing all your mana with his curses. He can cast perfect runes on command and is feared for his dragon egg curse, which if it lands will summon an enormous red dragon rune that will obliterate your health bar if it hits you. Before your battle with the teacher in each tower though, instead of earning a new rune, you earn a new ability for your pet. Yeah, it took a while, but we finally got around to this. Each character has a pet, and once you reach the Bronze Tower's final battle, you'll learn how you can use a pet to store a rune to be casted later, and when recast, that rune will always be casted perfect. At the Silver Tower, you'll learn to use your pet to activate the Super Shield to temporarily block even red and perfect runes while receiving no shield damage. And finally, at the Gold Tower, you get fuck all. <laughs> You lose! The perfect runes I rarely used initially, but I didn't notice for a long time that your pet actually recharges from casting a perfect rune much faster, maybe even just going by feel at triple the speed than compared to how long it takes to recharge if you activate the super shield. This is usually used when you want to connect a particularly nasty curse to go for an all-in attack to flip a losing game. But other than that, you mostly just use this in the Silver Tower because you're not able to use the Super Shield yet. Once you unlock the Super Shield though, things get serious. The ability to block any amount of damage from any attack, even for just a couple seconds, is irreplaceably game-changing. But of course, it is not just you who gets to do it now. Now the opponent can too. This is especially intimidating because you can't see how charged up your opponent's pet is. You never know really if they're able to super shield in that moment or not. They are still bound by the same rules, they do still have to wait for it to charge up, but because you can't see where their charge is at, it's much harder to tell how to deal with it. You have to play worrying that at any moment, unless your opponent just used the super shield, they might just obliterate your entire combo. The game now really punishes you, for banking on one massive attack and just assuming the opponent will not be able to deal with it. Because if you do that, they'll just activate their super shield and destroy what you just spent all your mana on. And you'll be left there now having to block attacks that have now caught up with you while not having any mana available. The super shield is uh, very important to the game to make it so games just don't end in seconds because you pull off some extremely powerful combo right at the start and kill them off the bat that they couldn't have possibly blocked. But at the same time, it does make the rune storage that pets can do pretty underused, unfortunately, because it is just that important. After you defeat the third and final teacher, though, you will have all three pieces of the One Wish rune. Every teacher you've defeated has told you to take responsibility with this rune, has tried to warn you of something. But every time this happens, Kalamazoo has always pulled you away before they can elaborate to tell you this is not a time to feel sad, this is a time to celebrate your achievement for beating one of the teachers. By now though, they're trying to warn you of something horrible that will happen if you ever unite the runes. But Kalamazoo isn't having any of it. Despite the teacher's warnings, Kalamazoo insists you assemble the pieces. And then... This is Hyperion. This is the one that the teachers tried to warn you about. 